Turbochargers, superchargers, and even both together. Forced induction has always been an easy way to gain massive power out of your vehicle. And in this video, we'll cover all the basics you need to know about the various types of forced induction and how it affects your vehicle as well as your wallet. So before we start, here's just a table of context I'm going to leave here at the beginning that you can reference back to if you need to jump somewhere. Anyways, I'm going to be repeating some information that I've said before, but just know that I want to get all the information in one place. So let's start off by defining naturally aspirated. A naturally aspirated vehicle is a vehicle that does not have any forced induction. Its power is all natural, meaning that it is just engine only, with no assistance from a supercharger or turbocharger. Many manufacturers usually just make naturally aspirated vehicles, but due to modern EPA standards, they have found out that smaller engines with forced induction can get better gas mileage and similar performance to that of its larger NA counterpart. For example, a naturally aspirated V8 like Ford's Coyote makes 460 horsepower. Another engine from Ford, their twin turbo V6, makes 450 horsepower. So despite having two less cylinders and less displacement, the V6 with the help of twin turbos can match the power of a V8 and supposedly get better gas mileage. Because of this knowledge, a lot of manufacturers started to use this in order to pass those modern EPA standards. However, what those manufacturers aren't telling you is that turbochargers have a lot of drawbacks, especially if you don't know how to use them. So I'll quickly illustrate the basic pros and cons of a turbocharger. So the pros of a turbocharger is that they're very powerful, and they're far more powerful than most superchargers ever will be. This makes them a great choice for someone looking to get as much performance as possible, especially out of smaller engines. Turbos accomplish this by making use of the car's exhaust gases, which are expended anyway, so putting a turbocharger in it really is just putting what was formerly waste into good use. This incredible efficiency will lead to better gas mileage depending on the competence of the engineers who designed them, as well as you, the driver. A lot of non-car people will absentmindedly keep their turbocharged car in boost, and thus it'll just keep spooling, and their MPG will actually be worse than a large naturally aspirated engine. One of my funnier memories about the EcoBoost Mustang owners is seeing them post on forums and complain about their average MPG of 18. Meanwhile, my big rumbling V8 Coyote, I got an average MPG of 22. This isn't unique to the Mustang, as many Veloster owners, Mercedes owners, Beamer owners, and really any car that's coming out with turbos these days, also have a lot of non-car people who fail to get better MPG. If you don't know how to properly drive a car for turbo, you're better off not buying one. That's not me trying to gatekeep, that's me giving genuine advice to help you save money. I know saving on gas sounds like money saved, but you'll quickly incur the costs elsewhere, so let's get on with the cons. Turbochargers, for the most part, aren't reliable. Most mechanics in real life, as well as the ones here on YouTube like Scotty Kilmer, they will tell you that turbochargers are just ticking time bombs. Aside from that, turbochargers also suffer from a phenomenon known as turbo lag. Turbochargers need time to spool up, as their power delivery is not instant. Now, to avoid the slag, engineers realize that they can use two smaller turbochargers in unison, and they'll make as much power as a single large turbo, but they won't lag as much. Twin turbocharged cars, they are usually separated into two categories, parallel or sequential. A parallel twin turbo is more common, and traditionally is the one most people think of when you say twin turbo. A parallel twin turbo is defined as a twin turbo setup in which two equal sized turbos are assigned to a cylinder bank which gives them the appearance of being parallel to one another. For inline engines, this case does differ slightly, but the end result is still the same. For sequential twin turbos, they get their name from using two turbochargers of differing size that operate at different engine speeds. The most common application of a sequential twin turbo is used to reduce turbo lag, and this is done by using a smaller turbo for lower RPMs, but then switching to a larger turbo at higher RPMs, hence sequential. Now, before we move on to superchargers, let's recap who exactly turbochargers are for. So all this talk about the MPG pales in comparison to how unreliable they are, especially if you don't know how to properly use them or take care of them. The bottom line is, if you're looking to save money and want a very simple car to drive that you don't even want to think about, honestly, you're better off not getting a turbo car. And even if you're someone right now who's saying, oh, it's not about the money argument, it's about the environmental impact, here's my response. It's actually better for the environment to get a naturally aspirated car that gets slightly worse MPG if it means that that car will survive the next 15 years, as compared to a turbocharged car that gets ever so slightly better MPG but is so unreliable that it needs to be replaced every 5 years. 
People forget that the very manufacturing process for a car, as well as its components, is also pollutive. Ultimately, the turbocharger's target audience is for those seeking peak performance from their engine, and intend to use it for drag racing or other high performance sport. Turbochargers will always reign king in the choice of performance. If you do have the dedication to care for a turbocharger as well as the need for speed, then go ahead and turbocharge away. If you want something simpler, cheaper to install, and more reliable, then a supercharger may pique your interest. The supercharger usually lives in the shadow of a turbocharger, as many famous movies, video games, and other forms of media hardly ever talk about them. Most people don't even know what a supercharger is until they become a car enthusiast. In short, a supercharger is another form of forced induction that is belt driven since it directly relies on the engine's power. The pros of a supercharger is that because it directly relies on the engine's power, its delivery is instant and linear. This means that it won't have the lag of a turbocharger and it also won't have the sudden boost kicking in feeling, as power delivery is more progressive and less aggressive. Superchargers are also more reliable than turbochargers and oftentimes can survive the whole lifespan of your engine. Now moving on to the cons. Despite being called super, superchargers aren't as efficient or as powerful as turbochargers. They run much less boost, and for their cost, size, and weight, they will make less power compared to turbochargers of similar price, size, and weight. Also, because they need to be married to your engine, you can't be as creative with placement. Most superchargers will lie directly on top of your engine. Whereas a turbocharger more or less can be put wherever you want. I've seen some people even put turbochargers in their trunk since they ran out of space in the engine bay. Meanwhile, superchargers already have such a hard time fitting under the hood since they need to lay on top of the engine. So usually you have to go that extra step and buy a bigger hood to house it properly. Or you can go old school and just cut a hole in your hood. That way you can let the whole world see your beautiful supercharger. Now, in regards to the types of superchargers, there are two main ones, a positive displacement and a centrifugal supercharger. A positive displacement supercharger is the most common type of supercharger, and has the typical appearance of laying atop the engine. They can have a thin box-like shape, though some of them will have a low, flat, wide shape. For example, this Roush supercharger on this Mustang needs a bigger hood to house it properly, but it makes for a brutal, muscular look. Meanwhile, the supercharger on my Z06 is very flat because it wants to maintain a low profile, that way the hood is low sweeping and it's just better for aerodynamics. Positive displacement superchargers also have a very linear power delivery that moves up from the moment you push your gas pedal and carries itself all the way through your rev range. Centrifugal superchargers, on the other hand, are becoming more popular as of recent because they are currently the cheapest form of forced induction on the market. But side note, just because they are the cheapest, it doesn't exactly mean they are the best bang for your buck like a turbo will. However, if you just got a muscle car, centrifugal superchargers are a cheap and reliable way to add a nice amount of power. Centrifugal superchargers tend to be the best of both worlds, they are often referred to as pro chargers, but that is actually just a popular manufacturer for them. Kinda like how everyone calls tissues Kleenexes, even though not all tissues are from Kleenex. Just know that not all centrifugal superchargers are made by pro charger. A centrifugal supercharger is oftentimes mistaken as a turbocharger by non-car people since, in the engine bay, it is a strikingly similar appearance. But just like any supercharger, it is still belt driven and thus relies directly on the engine's power. But it does have more freedom of placement, you don't have to put it on top of the engine. But unlike the positive displacement supercharger, a centrifugal supercharger does not deliver it linearly. It delivers more power at certain points in the RPM range depending on the boost. They give a similar boost kicking in feeling that turbochargers give, just not to the extent, and they also don't have the initial lag. So who are superchargers for? Well, they're usually for people who already have large engines, and they're just a way of adding more power reliably. Most American and Australian muscle cars are best suited for superchargers and oftentimes even come from factory with them. As for the Japanese and European cars with smaller engines, they can still get supercharged, but for the similar price and for similar size, a turbocharger will always make more power. If you are someone who's just looking for a little fun in your life without nearly as much of a headache, superchargers are the way to go. This lack of lag also makes supercharging a competitive option for track racing, as when you enter in and especially go out of corners, your car will always deliver power instantly each time you step on the pedal, so supercharged cars will come out of corners and usually smoke turbocharged cars. But if we're talking about straight line power where turbochargers get the time they need to properly spool up, Honestly, turbochargers will always have more peak performance in that aspect. And for someone who loves both superchargers and turbochargers and you want the best of both worlds, good news, something known as twin charging exists. 
Usually, it is better to pick one or the other, especially if you want your engine to still live until the next day, but with enough dedication, it is possible to do both, and it is commonly found on classic drag cars and other crazy contraptions. Not many production cars come with twin charging, unless you include the Mad Lads over in Denmark, who released the car known as the Zenvo ST1, which was twin charged. The Zenvo ST1 was beautiful, fast, and the first supercar ever made by Denmark. It was also one of the first cars to ever go up in flames on top gear and be broadcasted on worldwide television, but hey, you know what? At the end of the day, kudos to trying Denmark, it's not like we totally didn't tell you that that wouldn't happen, so I can just show people the picture of the Zembo ST1 whenever someone asks me what twin charging usually results in, because usually it results in your engine catching on fire. Now before we conclude this video, if you don't care about either power or fuel efficiency, and you just watched this video kind of for fun and wanted to save money, you'll always just be better leaving your car naturally aspirated and just give it power via other means and I'll make a whole video dedicated to how to get the most power out of your naturally aspirated engine. But like I said, the choice is yours. And I hope you feel enlightened with this newfound knowledge. The next video in my non-car guys guide series will be about engine components. I will see you then. Bladed Angel out.